floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm really excited to have this webinar today uh, and to introduce our speakers. Um, we're going to try to be somewhat informal today, and you might see some of that because for the first time, I'm going to be doing Q&A during a webinar. We'll see whether or not I've learned that. Um, but for today, I'm going to do some brief introductions. Um, then we're going to hand uh, things over to Autodesk. And first, we're going to hear a little bit about Autodesk Tandem. Um, and then second, we're going to hear a little bit about how digital twins and digital information can be used in building operations. And you'll see at the bottom of your, your screen there, there's a little detective guy looking through his, uh, his mirror thing. And for those of you who are in facilities, you know that one of the biggest problems we have is this technical term of where's my stuff? Where are my assets? Where are the things I need to take care of? And what do I need to do with them? And a lot of you have heard me speak about how BIM is a wonderful way, a repository to get information like that to help you better manage your facilities. Um, and there's, there's just one problem with BIM as you look at it. BIM is, it's a tool, but it's really a design tool. It's, it's not a managed tool. And as you know, we work with Autodesk, Autodesk is focused largely on design software. Um, but as we take a look at um, digital twins, and hold on a second, I'm sorry, my screen stopped sharing. I told you this was gonna be informal. I apologize, uh, my, my screen's back. Um, as we look at this, there's a group at Autodesk now that's specifically focused not on design software, but specifically focused on getting good information to the owners through the design and construction process. And they're out there with that, that the little magnifying glass looking upstream, talking to the AEC community, looking downstream, talking to the owners. And what's come out of that is something called, called Tandem. Um, so I'm going to turn things over today. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bob Ray, who's general manager for Tandem, um, Tim Kelly, who is the senior product manager, and um, Mark Morganshear, who's going to talk a little bit about applying this information, who's a customer success engineer with BIM 360 Ops. And then the one thing I'm just going to do before we get started is I'm going to start a poll here and just to help us understand what we should be asking you in terms of um, an audience. We've got AEC professionals here. We've got facility managers here. We've got um, people that are project management and other areas. If you could just uh, look at the poll there and click there and to kind of give us an idea of who's here so we kind of know where to focus. We don't want to start uh, too high in the weeds or too low in the reeds. So I'm going to close this poll out now. And coming back at it, it um, Bob, as I'm transferring over things over to you, it looks like 50%, 5% of us that are here are AEC professionals, about 20%, 13% are facilities, and about 20% are others. Oh, there it is. As I told you, this might be informal. I'm learning how to use this interface. So that being said, I'm gonna hand things over to Bob Bray and pass the baton. And Bob, you might be muted. I'm not muted, but I don't have an option to share my screen. Oh, there we go. No, I, I, the show my screen button is gray for me. I can't, I can't share my screen. There we go. And we are learning technology as we go. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Autodesk Tandem today. Uh, we started this project about a year ago and, and we did a little bit of research at the time. And what we discovered quickly was if we asked 10 people uh, to define a digital twin for us, we would often get 10 different answers, which was very enlightening. I think that's still true today, by the way, but it's, it's starting to take shape. The, the other thing we learned is that if we looked at the market and, and we found a true digital twin solution, 
Uh, they're typically created by a very expensive bespoke process of data collection that happens after turnover, curating all this information to actually create that digital twin. And, and as we dug into that, what we realized is that a lot of that data that goes into the foundation of a digital twin is data that is either created or captured during the, construct, the design and construction of a facility. So Tandem was born out of the realization that if we could harness all of this information created during design and construction, hand the owner a foundation of a digital twin and handover, then we could really start to power this ecosystem of digital twins and, and make it much more of a reality for uh, not only the AEC professionals and driving more value in, in what they can deliver to their customers, but also to the owner ecosystem and, and drive value downstream. So I'll talk a little bit about Tandem, starting with kind of opportunities and challenges. First and foremost, we define a digital twin as a digital replica of a built asset or facility. And, and what's important is that is a dynamic digital reflection of the physical entity. There has to be a bi-directional connection between the digital and the physical. Um, done correctly, they, they then possess the operational and behavioral awareness necessary to stimulate, predict, and inform decisions based on real world conditions. More importantly for me, as I looked at the space, was the opportunity that they present to really transform the, the built asset life cycle. Today, uh, Autodesk, of course, uh, sells software uh, to customers that plan, design, and build things. But there's a real opportunity to take all of that data, harness it, give it to the owner at handover in a, a more intelligent form, in a, in a digital model form that the owner can use downstream to connect into operational systems. That might be space planning or break to plan on demand maintenance or performance monitoring and tuning. And, and really through this connection of technology, build up a wealth of asset knowledge that can help to inform uh, the downstream portfolio planning process. And that might be informing decisions around, is it better to invest in a new asset, to uh, invest in uh, redevelopment of an existing asset? Uh, is, is the materials I used on this particular project are they performing well? Should I use them on a new project? Do I need to replace them in my existing project because they're causing problems? Same thing with equipment. Is it performing the way I expected? Uh, is it causing me maintenance headaches and maybe I should look at different equipment in, in a future project? So being able to answer those questions is highly valuable for an owner and allows us to make much more intelligent decisions throughout the asset life cycle. How we get there is the challenging part. Hey, Bob, can Thanks. I jump in really quick? I'm picking up a audio quality issue on your end. Is there a way you can, uh, is there a separate source you have to switch microphones or anything? I will try. Sorry to pause things. I just uh, wanted to jump in because I know I, I got a couple of messages of, of, of folks uh, listening in, so, so we have issues. Hey, Tim, is that better? Yes, it's much better. Interesting. All right, we will proceed. Is my screen still sharing, Tim? Yes, sir. Thanks. Verdantex last June published a paper uh, about maturity models for digital twins that I, I found quite useful. And it starts at the bottom of that uh, maturity model with, with the notion of a descriptive twin, which really is the uh, as-built model of the asset with that design and construction data captured in a way that it is live and editable and presents a view that is relevant to the owner. Um, they add to that the notion of informative and predictive twins. And this is where you start to connect operational systems to the digital model to gain information and, and insight predictive adding analytics to be able to say, you know, it, it is, you know, I've had maintenance issues on this particular component, uh, predicting potential other maintenance issues, and then moving up the stack to the notion of comp comprehensive and autonomous twins, which is really adding simulation and a level of autonomy so that that digital twin can make decisions and, and act on behalf of occupants or based on the operational performance of the facility. A couple of things are true here. The business value of a twin clearly goes up as you move from left to right, 
at the level of this digital transformation of both the AEC firm delivering this capability as well as the owner also needs to go up in order to support that, that new business value. The challenge in the industry, is, as everyone is well aware, is the flattening of data through the life cycle. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of uh, an engineering firm or an architecture firm or a contractor that has told me that owners often ask for BIM without any real way of articulating what they really need to operate their facility more effectively. We spend a bunch of time in the life cycle delivering a bunch of data that's locked away in Navisworks or Revit files and the owner never really uses it. Um, at the end of the day, owners receive a very analog stack of, of documents that represent that handover package when what they really need to, to be delivered is, in addition to those handover documents, a digital model that represents that as-built asset they can connect to their operation and information technology to really build that effective digital twin. And, and as I discussed with Autodesk and, and many people at Autodesk is, is really the question here is how do we deliver on BIM's you know, 20 plus year long unmet promise of, of a much more connected and data-centric workflow? And, and this is where Tandem was born to solve this problem. So with Autodesk Tandem, the intention is to allow teams to start digital and stay digital. Basically collecting all of that information created in design and construction and tracking what we call a digital thread of information for every asset in the facility from the day it's designed to the day it's decommissioned. Done right at handover, this then becomes a digital hub that can be used to integrate with all those new and existing systems to connect that digital model to the operational and performance data of its physical counterpart. And this can be done through, you know, API connections to existing systems. This can be done with partnerships that Autodesk is working on with geospatial vendors or IoT vendors or building management system vendors. But through these partnerships, we really hope to create a, a connected ecosystem uh, for a digital twin. The challenge, of course, uh, and it starts with BIM, is that you know architects and engineers today, they use Revit or other design tools. They capture a bunch of information. Uh, many times identifying parameters and other things that are unique to what they need to do to do their day-to-day -day jobs, but not really meeting the needs of the owner. And if instead we could have the project team collaborate with the owner up front, identify all of the assets and spaces that the owner cares about managing, that they need to achieve the outcomes they want to achieve, how they want to classify those assets, the various pieces of data they need for each of those assets to manage them effectively. And, and regardless of whether that's a standard like COBE or ISO 19650-3 or IFC, or, or maybe it's that the owner uses Maximo and they really want that asset model to look like Maximo, doesn't matter. It's about having that collaboration up front and then being able to capture all of that data through the project lifecycle to create that digital asset that's useful to the owner. If we do this, we get two benefits. The first benefit is we have this digital model that we can make accessible to a much broader set of stakeholders throughout both the project life cycle and the long-term operation of that facility. That might be 3D views, that might be indoor maps, or most of the time, that's just tabular data and making that tabular data accessible to that broad variety of stakeholders. More importantly, in my mind, is the idea that if this data is normalized in this model, we can validate that data at each handover point. Is the data in the twin at this handover point what I expect to be there and in the form I expect it to be in? We can do analytics on that data with both dashboards to, to verify data quality, uh, but also you know, know exactly when the last time a particular component was inspected. Um, but most importantly to all of this is, if that data is normalized and in a well-defined representation, then it's much easier to connect the various systems together to do system integration with CMMS systems or IoT systems or other types of systems that the owner may be uh, wanting to use or needing to use. Uh, we've talked a lot about the life cycle here, and the, the most important start part of this is starting at the very left with the project team really collaborating with that owner up front to say, what are you trying to achieve? What are the operational outcomes you're trying to achieve? And what data do you need to achieve those outcomes? 
And if we do that early and have that conversation, then it, we can create tools and workflows to make it very easy for project teams to capture and classify all that information through the design build process and commission that facility with a digital twin that the owner can then use to connect and collect that operational and performance data, to define system models, do simulations, things like that. It's also really clear with us in all of our conversations that a digital twin is not a static entity. It may be that you know at the beginning of the 2020, the most important thing to capture in your digital twin was understanding energy consumption and carbon emissions. And in 2021, it becomes contact tracing and, and really understanding the utilization of that facility and its spaces. So the, the twin needs to be able to adapt over time to new use cases and new problems. We've also talked to a number of existing facility owners. And this goes back to the very introduction where I talked about it being a bespoke process. It is more of a bespoke process here. Uh, but again, for an existing facility, it starts with understanding what, what the owner wants to achieve, what the data requirements are, what data do they have, what data needs to be created and captured, and then being able to create and curate that data into a digital twin so that the rest of the downstream life cycle is the same. Um, that could be through scanning a, a facility and, and modeling from that scan, uh, collecting data from existing CMS or asset management systems, um, or, or using existing model data that, that maybe they have, depending on the age of the facility is, is going to depend on the solution. Bob, this might be a good time to, I got our second poll um, to kind of ask, because sure. you were talking about different standards. Um, I'm just going to send this out and just let me pop this up here um, in our second uh, question. So as we talk about standards, um, in your experience, uh, how relevant are the standards for deliverables like COBE, IFC, ISO 19650-3? And um, I should have, you know, if I put this together, would also say uh, and TPS reports. So I'll give that a second or two most familiar with TPS reports, somewhat on the rest, right? <laughs> so just closing out that poll now, um, as we take a look at it, um, we can see that 51% of you said somewhat, 22% um, said very, and 28% said not at all. Um, so, you know, I would take this as we're making some headway with regards to standards, but have quite a way to go, Bob. And, and I actually, I, I'm really encouraged by that result because we believe that um, standards will really help to drive um, solutions like Tandem and, and digital twin solutions overall. Uh, standards will really help the industry move forward. <laughs> Uh, moving forward just a little bit, so the Autodesk Tandem data model is really very open, very flexible, and designed to implement those various standards that are emerging in the industry. Um, every facility has a, a set of assets or contains a set of assets, is made up of a set of spaces, there is a relationship between assets and spaces, and of course every asset is typically a part of a system of some sort that is serving those spaces or zones. Um, this data model is intended to be templatized so that we can create a template of something like a data center or a, a commercial office building or other types of templates and those templates can be reused over time. The most important two types of, of items in this data model that we're really focused on right now is assets and spaces. An asset for us is some kind of a useful or valuable thing that the owner wants to track and manage over time, needs to track and manage over time. They're always part of a facility. They're typically part of a system. They have a very specific asset types and asset types as Tim will show are defined in tandem and every asset type has a set of parameter data associated with it that, that comes from that asset type. And sets for us today are always created from a model element. Um, there are unmodeled types of assets that we're, we're talking about how to support but for right now in tandem, every asset comes from a model element. They're typically contained with or have a relation to a space. Um, one of the important aspects of tandem is that we do manage the history of every asset through time. 
so we know exactly uh, who touched that asset, what the change was that was made, and all of the histories of that value through time. And, and then finally, we anticipate connecting this to IoT systems and other kinds of operational systems so that that asset can understand its performance and usage over time. Similarly, spaces are always part of a facility. They contain assets. Uh, they have a well-defined space type, just like an asset. And, and spaces can also have parameters associated with them. So you can identify a pump room or a hospital room or those types of things. And that would have specific parameters associated with that type of space. They may be created from a model element. What we've found in looking at design tools, Revit and others, is that uh, floors or levels and, and rooms uh, provide a good starting point, but they don't meet every type of facilities needs for defining spaces. So we'll probably provide some tools in tandem to actually model spaces or refine that space definition. Just like assets, there's a set of data contributors and consumers. We understand the history of that space over time, and we want to be able to connect operational data, both in terms of usage and performance to that space over time. As we look at the workflows in tandem, they're really organized around the concept of trying to achieve better outcomes. And we're really targeting right now with this notion of digital handover. Digital handover for us is a workflow that's broken down into three steps. It starts with really specifying those desired operational outcomes and all of the data requirements inside tandem, typically at the beginning of the project, but could be any time through the life cycle. Second step of that workflow is really starting to capture and verify the data uh, by connecting uh, Tandem to the rest of the tools in the ecosystem that, that project teams use. That might be Revit, that might be uh, Autodesk Build, other, other tools in the Autodesk Construction Cloud or other design tools. But basically being able to bring that data into Tandem in an automated way and verify that that data is accurate as it maps into the Tandem data model. And then the third part of this is, of course, at the end of the life cycle, being able to hand over that facility model, uh, leaving out all of the stuff that's proprietary to the design build process and giving the owner that operational copy of that, that, that uh, as-built model. We believe and there's... Think, a, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I think this might be the best spot for, for our next question. Um, if we'll just get here. So the um, question is, um, are you able to articulate your asset data needs before design begins? And there are no TPS reports here, but I'll give a couple minutes, seconds for uh, the answers to come in. So I'm going to close the poll out now. And um, as we can see here, you know, about 70% of you said sometimes, 10% um, get a gold star um, there at yes, and 22% um, are, are at no. Those are pretty consistent with many of the customer conversations we have, by the way. And, and a lot of that comes down to, do you have the right mechanism to have that conversation? And I think that's been missing in the industry for a very long time. And one of the things we're trying to do is really help project teams and our AAC customers have those conversations and have a way to encode those data requirements in a, in a place that they can then begin to capture that data and verify that data. So that's, that's good response rate. In terms of digital handover, we believe the value of that is in two things. Uh, the first value delivered here is really if you are collaborating with that owner early in the project life cycle, understanding those data outcomes, then it enables much better transparent collaboration as you reach those handover points, validating not only the build of the facility, but all of the data the owner requires through that process. And two, you know, instead of that stack of paper and all that analog data that the owner would typically receive at handover, and over, you know, giving them that digital replica of that facility that can really accelerate their operational readiness 
in, in providing them easy access to all that detailed facility information in, in a digital model form. Longer term, we believe this will lead to opportunities to uh, transform the asset lifecycle, as I discussed earlier, through kind of the asset management phase and the facility management phase of the life cycle. And, and we see this through connections to other technology and connecting tandem to other technology. That might be space planning solutions, that might be uh, CMMS solutions, or BIM 360 Ops, as, as Mark's going to talk about in a bit. Um, and to IoT solutions to really help understand the performance and, and tune the performance of that facility over time. This, in our mind, leads us to this roadmap of digital twin maturity and going back to this, this digital twin maturity model where our near-term focus is very much focused on creating that descriptive twin or that as-built model of the asset and space data that the owner needs and then beginning to connect that to operational data moving up this maturity model. Tandem over time will be a solution that will help with this notion of digital handover, working with our existing tools in our AEC collection and in Autodesk Build to kind of capture and curate all of that information for a digital twin through the design build lifecycle and then operationalizing that data uh, through the operations. And at that point, Tim, I'm gonna hand it over to you to give a demo. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. It was a fantastic overview. Um, so I'm, I'm going to attempt to keep the demo um, brief, uh, but with that said, what I'll do to start is actually kind of present the end in mind. So ultimately, the goal of Tandem is to organize data in a meaningful way where uh, as a, a end user of this facility data, I can navigate to a specific view or a particular point location in my facility. I can select a relevant asset and I can see all of the information that I need. Um, as we move forward, as Bob talked about, we want to layer in <clears throat> more uh, you know, streaming information and, and additional data about the performance of this uh, uh, particular asset. But, but to start, we, we want to have access to the information that I'm using to manage and maintain this particular component. Um, that said, I have this um, particular object classified um, as, a, as a type, and with that type, I'm inheriting a, a block of information that's my requirement or my uh, data set that I want populated. Um, this information is uh, text values, it's a numerical or a, a unit of measure, it's uh, link information. Ultimately, it's, it's a, a, a set of data that I need to actually work with this particular component. Um, so how do we set that up? Um, and in order to go about setting that up, we actually start with what, what Bob was defining as our uh, organization structure and our data set that we are specifying we need to work with. Um, so, you know, the poll questions related to, you know, how often do you know ahead of the project uh, what data you need? Um, most of you say sometimes. Uh, that's okay. We're, we're working with the, an environment that's flexible and can adapt as the project evolves, and, and we can actually specify that on a rolling basis. Um, to start in our specification and, and defining what we want out of the digital twin, the first thing we'll do is actually set up our classification system. Um, we asked about uh, industry standards or classification systems that exist. In, in this case, very typically, these are related to the design and construction industry and how we organize things um, for you know, requirements of particular components. This list is comprehensive in the case of master format or uniform format or unit class or, and na name your standard. Um, but in a number of cases, we know that we want to have some simplified uh, asset breakdown structure where we just have the broad groups and particularly uh, potentially some subtypes or groups um, underneath that. And that's that's really all you need for your use case. Um, so we have some flexibility in allowing you to define um, exactly what asset breakdown we have. The idea behind asset breakdown is we're defining the types and how those types relate to one another and, and ultimately uh, you know, bundling your systems and, and your structure of your data set. When we think about a, a metadata that we want applied to that, um, again, we have templates here and we're pulling from industry standards and, and have a you know, comprehensive look at you know, what require, requirements are there for you know, pumps or uh, what requirements might you have for a chiller. Um, this information is coming from uh, you know, uh, 
standard definition. However, again, uh, just like uh, previous and the, the classifications, you can go in and create and define your own. So if I, you know, wanted to find my own, I was just going to create a demo set here and I'm going to say Autodesk. And I'm going to define where this data set applies. Let's imagine I want to apply this to um, my interior construction as an example. I create that and, and then I can begin building this out from scratch. Um, and in this case, I might say model number and that is going to be a text field and I'm going to define that to relate to an individual item or a, a broader type of items. Um, and, and instead of just um, boring you guys with developing a bunch of those, I'll just pick one that's already created and say, you know, in this case I have for interior doors, I want the door number, the type, the lock set number, the warranty information, installation date. Uh, th this is going to help me maintain my, my doors across my facility. So I'm going to leverage this information and that is applied to interior doors. So if I quickly go in and instead of working with an existing facility, I'm just going to start from scratch. Let's create a sample facility. Um, what this is going to do is actually import my models for me. Every um, digital twin or facility in tandem, it starts with them as its source. Um, to incorporate that, we can either directly upload Revit files or source information that's already stored in BIM 360 uh, within your docs environment leveraged by uh, anything that you're using in that ecosystem. Um, so I can you know, reach across, I can uh, associate models as necessary and, and bring them into my facility. From there within the facility, uh, we're going to specify which classification system uh, we want to leverage. Um, and in this case, um, uh, you know, you, you pick your classification system and then begin applying your parameter sets. Uh, so quickly, I'm just going to select interior doors that parameter set I was just working with. And, and I have an opportunity now to map information that I've captured um, from my Revit model into the parameter set that I want here. Um, in this case, I can say type name, and that's a property that I already have hosted inside of um, my model that was pulled in from Revit. Um, so I can actually map things into my uh, discrete asset data set. You know, map as, as many as necessary. And then um, if I begin working with this data set, when we actually publish uh, those models, we do what we call normalization. So we begin to populate uh, what system, uh, what grouping this um, the components belong to. Uh, so if I actually want to subdivide that model by saying, let's go look at level two and all of the interior components, I can see that I have, um, you know, all, all of the information that was classified as level or uh, interior. Um, and I'm going to select a door here and we're going to start to work with uh, that data set. So um, for this particular door, uh, when this data pulls up shortly. Give that a second. Um, what I want to go about doing is actually specifying that this is actually an interior door and then that data set that I've associated with that parameter set is going to be applied to this asset. So I'm going to go to interior construction, interior doors. Now I have information here about that door that I want captured, the current status, the door number, um, the installation date, et cetera. As this data set is being populated, we're capturing a full history of all of the changes. So let's say I had the door number wrong, it's actually 106, or let's say um, later on I, I realized that no, in fact, on level two, it's 206. Um, every change that's made in, in terms of, um, you know, from, from the time this is um, commissioned or the, the facility begins, uh, and until you want to erase that history or until you're decommissioning an asset, uh, th this is going to maintain that entire history of that data set. So as I'm working with this data, uh, you, you see me just kind of quickly for a single item populating information. However, if we're working with a broader data set and, and we actually want to say, okay, for all of our interior doors, let's go ahead and populate some information about that based on the supplier, based on the manufacturer, what, what, what not. Um, I can actually drill down to that specific type or that uh, specific grouping. If I actually um, turn off my ghosting here, you'll be able to see this better. Okay, so great. So I have all of my doors for level two. I'm going to uncheck level two and I'm going to see all of my 
uh, doors across the facility. In this inventory here, I can actually see um, all of these doors populated. Um, for the item that I just created, I actually um, reclassified from C interiors to C1030 interior doors. So let's go ahead and do that for all of the items uh, that I have in this inventory. And I can say copy value to all. Uh, so now I'm, I'm leveraging this inventory view to actually basically copy and paste to a broader data set. Um, from there, uh, I can go about saying this is 207, this is 208, et cetera, and, and begin filling out my data set. Other you know, shortcut methods or, or you know, quick batch updates, I can actually take this data set out to Excel, share it out with others, collect data, bring that information back in, um, and do a broader uh, you know, capture of, of that data set. Um, as Bob talked about toward the end of his presentation there, as we're defining this data model, as we're populating um, the information that's the structured data we want captured in our facility, uh, one of the next step items we're working on is how we define a template that you can reuse again and again. And within that template, and um, you know, how we structure data there, we'll begin to be able to verify that this data is captured and is complete and accurate. Um, so, you know, items uh, in our future, but something that we're evaluating how we move toward that now. Um, just one a couple quick uh, additional items. Um, as we're you know, looking at history and information that changes across the facility, um, I can actually see beyond uh, just the, the properties panel and looking at the history of that discrete asset. I can see all of the changes that have occurred across the facility. So as I was populating those numbers or making changes to the uniform at, um, information, I can see uh, where all that occurred. And, and if I need to drill in and go find a particular asset where a change occurred, I can actually select uh, and navigate to that particular component uh, to do further investigation or management of that. Um, and then lastly, as I'm uh, you know, setting this information up and I want to actually return to a specific data set or a specific view uh, of information, I can populate um, a saved view and, and ultimately navigate back to the saved view uh, directly you know, um, between views and uh, on my own in the product, or I can share this link out and have others interact with this particular data set or this view um, as necessary. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark. Mark's going to actually jump from here into uh, demonstrating workflow for ops. All right. So uh, let's see. So can you, uh, so, so here we have tandem and here we have the, the exact same model that was just shown. And we have these views that, that Tim was talking about. So we've got a ductwork view. We've got uh, actually a corridor view. You know, we can come in, look at the second floor, see how it's done. And as you see, the data all changes. But what I want to focus in on is I want to look at this air handling unit right here. I've got the same view of air handling unit, or I can look at the ductwork and you can see the data is changing as we move forward. So I can click on the air handling unit, I wanna come up here and look at the properties. And then as we move forward, we're gonna be able to open up the management systems, the BIM 360 ops, to be able to look at the asset data for this air handling unit. And we can look at the 3D, a, a very granular model inside of ops for this facility technician so that they can see the, the graphical concept of what's near it. You know, giving them access to the model, but not making them become a BIM person. We can Q, look at all the QR codes, see the schedules that are set up, the quarterly PMs, the, the preventive maintenance, all of that, you know, the pictures. Here's, here's the model that I, uh, that I use to scan my barcodes with, you know, different pictures like this that we can have, training videos. We can also link back to the BIM 360 assets to look to see how that specific piece of equipment was commissioned so that we can start looking at making sure your building is running efficiently as possible and how it was optimally set up during the commissioning process. So taking all of this data and looking at it, being able to look at the building automation systems 
and understand what's going on with your airflows, what's going on with your filters, what's going on with your dampers, all quick access, understanding your building and letting the technician have this at their fingertips. Not only are we looking at the manufacturer model, but we're syncing all this building commissioning data between the platforms, giving a true better way at, to manage the building with the twin from the grid data that the technician is maintaining out in the field. And now what we can do with that as I switch to my iPad is we can actually start looking at the ticketing processes. We can see what's going on, what tickets have been done. You can see that we've got roundings. We've, in, our, in our world today, we've got sanitizer stations that need to be checked. We need to know that they're being worked on. We need to know that they're being looked at. We, but what we can do also is let's come in here and see what's around us. Actually use an indoor map of the facility to understand where tickets are located and what tickets are nearby me. And then we can also start looking at just our sensor tickets. Do I have any sensor tickets? Well, where are they? What, you know, how are they working? What are they functioning? What are they, where are they flowing? But then we have assets as well. Where is my sensor asset in the building? I'm going to clear that, look at the other assets, and start understanding how it's in the building. How many of us have wanted to know where a VV box is? It's right here, right there, easy to understand and easy to access the data. So let's look at our hand sanitizer stations. You're very critical in today's world. Well, let's come up here and look at hand sanitizer station. Being able to access this data, look at our tickets from the map, look at our 3D model from a map, all as a maintenance technician, tying this data back to the digital twin to make better decisions about what's happening in our facility. Understanding what needs to be done and where in a critical pathway. So, um, and then also looking at photos, being able to access this data in a unique, easy way. So what, what if I'm not familiar with the facility? What if I'm coming here looking at these assets and I wanna come and, and find this lighting panel here in corridor two, in, in the electrical room 225? We have the capabilities of being asset specific and locate geolocating all of the, all of these devices. What about a fire extinguisher in the stair? We all, fire extinguishers have to be inspected. We've got to understand all of those, all of the data about those. Being able to tie all of this asset data together in a digital twin is going to help us understand and move back and forth. We've got a facility owner operator, we've got a facility technician and tying that data rich information in a valuable way to help understand and make better decisions is what we're truly looking at. Now, one of the things that, that we can do with this nearby map, graphical representations of a heat map. What is going on in my facility and how can I better make a graphic that helps me understand where I need to work? Why do I have more tickets on the second floor up here in this room? What is going on with that facility, with that room right there? So we're looking at that, but then we're also giving you access to just a clean map. So if we want to look at these rooms, if we want to look at the mechanical yard here, and we can look at the mechanical yard, we can see that we have 18 associated tickets in there. You can see that we have all the mechanical roundings. You can see that we need to come back later and fix a leak. We've changed the filter. We can see all of the assets right there in this model. Now, what if let's let's come over here and let's let's go to level two and let's look at this mechanical room here. We got a chiller, you know, we've got our air handling unit, we've got our VFD. All this type of 
information right here at our hands, understanding what's going on in each one of these individual rooms. So a question was asked about laser scans. What, what accessing all of these rooms, accessing all of this data, and accessing all the, the 3D, the 3D data, including pictures, including photos, being able to access this information in a unique, fast way, whether you're a technician, whether you're a facility manager, understanding this data in a way and accessing it quicker, faster than we've ever done before. That's what we're going to be able to do with the digital twins. And one of the things I want to bring back, step back here to the digital twin to show you is I have all of these categorized by a facility standard that is all your own. So we've, we've made this model so that it's categorized in a way a facility management person or a facility technician can understand it. So think about that when you're, when you're building a facility data spec, when you're or, trying to organize your data for facilities management, for building operations, how, what data, how is the data going to be understood by the people who are going to be using it? Peter, and I'm going to turn this back to you, Peter, and let you uh, answer your question, give some questions there. Thank you, Mark. So we've got one more question that I'm going to send out for a poll. Um, and let me launch that. Um, so do your contacts contracts, I'm sorry, today specify facility management data requirements. And I'll give you some time um, to you respond. You know, Peter, me and you've talked about that a lot, you know, and that's that's a, such a critical aspect of all that we're talking about here. And uh, it's a very interesting topic, that's for sure. And I'm closing that out. And Mark, can you just give control to me one more time? I didn't seem to grab it. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Let's share the results here. So as we take a look at it, um, about 30% of you are, I'm sorry, um, are, and, and about 70% of you aren't. So in wrapping things up, let me just share my screen here. I think we need to close the poll and then you should be able to share. Um, yeah, that, um, oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm back. So right before we go to um, kind of some questions and answers, I just had this slide here. I know this is a little long for which I apologize, but um, we kind of talked today about two things. So um, Tandem is uh, in uh, beta. It's not, not a product yet, and um, you're welcome to uh, apply to join the Tandem Beta community. And there's a URL up for that. And then Lori, so you don't need to write this down, is going to cut and paste this into the chat. Um, and then if you'd like to learn more about BIM 360 Ops, um, there's a second link there, which is uh, on the Imagine It webpage. And I've got a couple different presentations that we conducted with Mark Morganshire, who just presented on that. Um, so that being said, Lori, do we have any questions? Yeah, just before we get started, I did uh, put those links into the chat window. If I can maybe just have somebody, I know we've got a ton of people on. If I can just have somebody um, enter or just say you can see them, hopefully I've done that correctly for you. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so Peter, where would you like me to start um, with the q and there's, there's a thank you so much, Bob. Um, Bob and Tim have been answering, oh, and Mark as well, um, while they're in between um, presenting today. So I can do the ones that, Peter, can you see the, can you see the questions? Um, I can. I've there's got them a here too, list Bob. of them. I'm, I'm not wondering sure where the best part to start is. There's a long list of questions. Yeah, Bob, what do you think is, is the best place to start? Because you've answered most of these 
um, questions as it is. I wouldn't say most, but I've been trying to aggressively answer questions as best I can. <laughs> uh, um, uh, okay. We, we can just jump in and grab kind of, I, I'm, I'm looking through the list here and, and I'll ask, um, can we import this custom data from Excel or is it a hard entry in the app? Uh, I'm assuming we're talking parameter sets um, and currently that's hard entry in the app. And in the future, we would expect that, you know, given the variety of sources this specification is coming from, we would like to have some sort of uh, import. Um, in the case we're talking about the, the actual values of information, I, I, yes, we have support for Excel import. And, and ultimately, in the future, we want to have you know, sort of direct API access to manage and, and maintain this kind of uh, connectivity to, to the either the, the specification or definition of what you need um, or ultimately the um, data that's captured for for those assets so there's a question okay. about capability to connect live data from equipment into ops so so bin 360 ops lets the automation systems handle the the live stream of the data what we do is monitor the set we can monitor you can set up the set points in the automation system, which then triggers an email alert. Ops auto generates a ticket off of that email alert. And therefore we get the ticket, we get the, the timestamp, we know that it's out of compliance. And therefore then the ticket triage team can send a technician to that room or asset to see what's happening with that asset. And that's all done through your email address, no API integration. Okay. Uh, do you want me to, I can read one out to you guys? Sure. Uh, is Tandem basically making project parameters uh, for all of these elements? Bob, I'll jump in on that one. I, I think if, if we're speaking project parameters in Revit, the answer is no. Uh, Tandem is actually maintaining and managing the parameter set uh, in our database. However, we are working on uh, a workflow where you can display that information back inside of Revit directly. Um, and I think the discussion would be, you know, what, what's the need for creating those as project parameters and storing them inside of the Revit model? Um, certainly, we've had a number of discussions with customers where they're doing that today because there's not a better solution for storing the asset data long term. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a that's a workflow we see really uh, a common workflow we see. And ultimately, you know, we we certainly want to act, give access to that information, but but not necessarily store all of that information in Revit. So that um, yeah, I think that's 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 about where we are in that. There's another one here about synchronization with BIM 360. And if we use BIM 360 to store project data, will that model be synced to Tandem? And the answer to that is you can connect data from BIM 360 into Tandem. And you will see, uh, you'll be able to select when you want to update those models inside of Tandem. We, we debate whether or not it's right to just automatically sync. Uh, versus giving you a notification and allowing the tandem user to choose when to update those models. At the end of the day, we'll probably offer some flexibility here, take an event, manually do it, uh, make it a timed event so that it happens on a regular occurrence, uh, and potentially an automated update. But that, that piece is we're less sure of the automated update because you may not want each design change flowing into tandem from week to week. You may want to do it only monthly or, or on a more regular cadence. Okay, great. Uh, I've got one here. Um, in addition to asset management, are there, are there space management features in tandem? Example, res reservations, cleaning, occupancy data services, et cetera, and the ability to access 2D space data. So, so ops can do inspections like cleaning environment. So hospitals, environment of care tickets, roundings. Ops has that capability through a ticketing process to do to do some of that. 
Yeah, and I'll jump in and say, um, I, Bob described our thought on space management inside of tandem and um, kind of what we think of as our anatomy for that. Um, with that said, it, it's still early and, and it's something that we're evaluating or working through now um, in its early stages. Um, I, I will say Bob and I uh, actually just saw from our engineering team yesterday uh, the first iteration of how we would organize assets by spaces and, and uh, create that um, uh, structure to navigate space by space and see what, what's contained uh, uh, within that uh, space is defined. Great. Hey, Bob, I'll, I'll ask this one because I actually see it a couple of times here. Um, I think this was before Mark began speaking, but um, the question is, is Tandem replacing BIM 360 Ops? It, yeah, de definitely not. I think there are synergies between Tandem and BIM 360 Ops. You've probably seen those in the course of the presentation today. Internally, we recognize that at Autodesk and the BIM 360 Ops team is now actually uh, a part of the Tandem team. And you will see us continue to pursue that integration that Mark showed today and uh, and make that a part of the ops offering moving forward. And then Joel had a follow up question. Can Tandem work with dot NWD? Yes. NWDS. Yeah, I answer questions about formats in there, um, but that's a good one. So today we work with Revit files. We do ingest or aggregate all of our data through the Forge pipeline. So that opens up a wealth of formats for us over time in a very consistent and, and standardized way to support those formats. So as we progress uh, over the months ahead, we'll be, I, we'll be basically supporting a broader array of formats uh, through time. Great. Sorry for the pause. I'm just going through these to see what we've answered and what we haven't. So bear with me. So there's a question about ops and updating for renovations uh, or for remodels. So BIM 360 ops, we were able to recognize what elements have changed in the model. We use the mark parameter as the asset ID in a lot of how we handle the data that's the new data that's coming from Revit is around the mark parameter and we do not overwrite existing data if it's in there and we see the new data that comes through and then we populate new data into ops for a you know a, a tenant finish out for a shell space finish out or for a remodel. Okay. Um, how would a project be handled over a customer? Let me just elaborate that. Uh, how would a, how would a project be handed over to a customer, and how would that work with a license share standpoint? Well, that's a very fine question. Um, our belief is that there's one of two models here. Either the AEC firm extends their business model to really manage this data long term on behalf of that owner, which means a new revenue stream for the AEC firm, or the owner would buy a license specific to uh, Tandem and Ops uh, for their operational data or a combination of both. We're still working through the answer to that question. Uh, we certainly have AAC firms that we're talking to that really want to extend their business model and see an opportunity for their expanding their business. We also are talking to a number of owners that are very interested in this and, and actually, you know, putting it in, in place across all of their project ecosystem. So there, there is no cut and dry, it's this or that. It's, it's likely a combination over time. Okay. So we are at two o'clock. Uh, if I can just read one more question for you. Um, and then Peter, if you can just maybe move to the to the last slide for today. Um, so the question is, can you 